Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Christ Our King Community Church, and good morning to those of you who are visiting. Uh, it is always a joy for us to gather uh, together. And one of the things, this has been now a month, and we've been gathering this way, and I'm just excited that we're getting a chance to continue being who we are as a community. And you can see that when you look at some of the messages that some of you have already sent. Hey, I encourage you to continue to share the love. Please share this with others uh, as well. It's been a good week. I so loved our time on Easter. And, and listen, someone commented of just the production skills of First Lady. Yes, I am thankful for First Lady and how she's producing uh, for us in many ways to continue to have an intimate experience and in connecting it through this times and through this means of Facebook Live. And, and let me just say this as well, too. I am thankful for some of the work that's being done so that we can continue to be up to speed as far as connecting uh, this message with as many people as possible. Thankful for Curtis and, and others who are really getting our technology so that we'll be able to live stream. And we're going to be doing that in the future. However, I just feel like that for this season, for a while, that we want to continue to be Facebook Live. And the reason for that is because the messages that we're talking about, we're discussing, I like this platform, which makes it intimate, makes it personal. Uh, and you'll even see that as we continue in our series today. I also just want to bring to your attention a couple of things. I want to mention this. One, let me give just an incredible shout out to our children's church leaders and teachers. It is beautiful to hear about how our teachers are teaching, again, our kids online and our young people online and doing this through these platforms and here's the reason why because and I, and I thought about this even as we were praying today and also love the prayer time at 9 30 uh, have loved the prayer times that we have 6 30 every friday morning uh, where many of us will call in to pray but what i love is is that i believe during this time of COVID 19 we all have been hit by just some radical change i pray our children will remember this not as the time that we didn't have church, but that church became, as God intended, adaptable, that we were continuing to be the church, not simply go to church. And I pray that our young people through our teachers, that, and that they would walk away from this experience, remembering this as a time of, man, I learned so much about what it means to be a Christ follower. And I pray that we will continue to affirm our teachers. Hey, I'm thankful for Rodney Alexander and his leadership, Minister Rodney and Lisa, and the other team of children's church teachers who've really been leading us through this time. I'm also thankful for the small group leaders. Man, small group leaders have been showing up and I think an even more critical role than ever before, especially since we're in a stay at home reality, that connecting with your small group is going to be critical and important. And then one more thing, I think that as we walk through this time and as we're being the church, we want to still give financially. And I am so thankful that many of you have found the reality of doing that. And I realize that for all of us, this is a time of really what the Bible talks about, of sacrificial giving. Well, I think one of the things the elders and I have talked about is that we're going to have to sort of not repurpose our giving, but we're going to have to give now in a beautiful way because the needs of the church, the needs of the community, responding to those needs, our financial gifts really matter in order for that to happen. So I would encourage you to continue giving. Hey, if you don't know how to utilize uh, PayPal to be able to do that and give online, then Robin, our administrator, you can send her an email and you, if you feel more comfortable with sending a letter or sending a check by mail, hey, we just want to make that possible. But we are thankful that we're continuing to give as we continue to meet the needs 
not just of our community, but the need for us to be the church uh, in our community and in the world. Well, what I want to do this morning is I want to take us back to, I want to take us back to our series. And our series that we did before Easter was out of First Thessalonians. And so if you have your Bible, if you have your copy of God's Word or your device, if you could come with me to First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, let me read the passage and then I'll make... Uh, some comments in many ways about the passage. There's one more thing uh, as we begin. I think there's just a lot of things that's been happening, and I want to acknowledge that before I move any further, that there that COVID-19 has affected us personally in some deep ways, even us personally as a church. Uh, there are a number of members in our church who have lost loved ones. I think right there, please keep Mike Stevens in you, Angie, in your prayers, Mike's father passed, and this yesterday they had to go and do a funeral uh, for his father in Georgia, and that during this time is challenging. There have been a number of other people who've had family members who have uh, ended up contracting COVID-19. Let's remember to keep them in our prayers. Let's also remember to pray for some people who were struggling even before this. Let's continue to pray for Maurice as he is continuing to recover, having to go through different various treatments in this time. Let's also pray for Pastor Brickle as he experienced uh, an incredible knee leg injury. Let's continue to keep them in our prayers. And I would encourage us to be vigilant to praying for one another, but to make it known to your small group leader as there are needs that come up or people who need to be prayed for. The reality is that this is a struggle in many ways than what any of us can imagine. It's critical that we do not struggle alone. Well, let me read for you where we're gonna be spending most of our time today. First Thessalonians chapter four. First Thessalonians chapter four. Beginning with verse one. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you're doing, that you do so more and more. Verse two. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress or wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warn you. <laughs> you know, that passage is a passage that I first encountered when I was in college. This passage has always been a passage that has been challenging. And challenging because even when we think about this passage, some of us bring our focus and our attention on down to verse three, where it really gets into the whole purpose of this section now is our sanctification. But then in verses four on through verse eight, He's very specific to the Thessalonians about an area that challenges our sanctification. I'm going to explain that in a few moments in today's message, about an area that challenges our sanctification, and that's sexual immorality. You know, I have to admit, as, as some of us at Christ our King, you know that I will say this, and, and this is because this is what I love about being a pastor, and I love about being a pastor that is teaching expositionally, because Sometimes when you teach now expositionally, you don't get to pick and choose what text you, you want to talk about. And this particular text is a text, especially when we move to the part about sexual immorality, that in my younger years, that even in my years of, of leadership and trying to help people with what it means to live a holy, pure life, I'll be honest, I have taught this text in a way that really didn't pay enough attention to the context. And that's why today we're gonna to spend most of our time in verses one through three. 
most of our time in just three verses. Next week, we're going to come and really give attention to what it really means, this idea of our sanctification and sexual immorality. Here's why. I feel like we live in a culture. We live in a culture where this whole construct, this whole idea of what it really means to be sexually pure, what does it really mean to that our bodies belong to the Lord? It's become complicated. And let me just say this. It's not simply complicated for those who are seeking to understand more about Jesus. It's complicated for those of us who are followers of Jesus. And so I want to make sure to spend time, take my time. Uh, and, and if some of you were sitting out there, I know you would say, give me feedback. Take your time, Pastor. I want to take my time through this text. Because humbly, I realize that there's some things that have even had to be corrected in my thinking as we really challenge people to what does it really mean to be sanctified? What does it really mean to deal with sexual immorality? And that is a harder message to understand, I think, today than ever. So because of that, I want to spend my time in these first couple of verses. I, I think it's important that we not forget that, remember, Paul is writing Thessalonians to this group of people who, and if you want to study the background a little bit more, you go to Acts chapter 17, because this is a group of people, this is a church that he had only spent about a month with. And because of persecution, he had to leave that church and he ended up having to write letters to them. Now, I have something here that uh that i just want to show you and some of you I've, I've mentioned this before but i came across this the other day again this is a letter that my father wrote to my mom in 1940. this is the actual envelope here's the actual paper the ink is fading 1940 before my daddy was going off to serve for two years in world war ii uh and he would leave and go and serve in italy and he wrote this in new york as he was trying to figure out where he was going to be placed and i tell you i had this hard silent black father who really didn't show a lot of affection and emotion <laughs> when i read this not, I'm not going to put my dad's business in the street too much, but when I read this, I go, man, my dad, my dad had a rap. My, my dad really knew how to speak words of love. You know what's so incredible is these words that he wrote to my mom were out of love, and they felt when I was reading them alive. I, let me just be honest. When I read what my dad said to my mom and the affection he had for her, because this is before they were married, Man, it brought tears to my eyes. It had an impact, even though this was written in 1940. Can I suggest to you that the word of God has impact, that the word of God is written out of love and it should still move us. Here's why. Because my dad and mom have gone on. They have passed. Both of them have. Jesus is alive. And Jesus is alive and his words are living. If the words of love could live in paper that was written in 1940, then these words are alive today. I would encourage us as we listen today to this passage to know that the Apostle Paul has written a letter to the Thessalonians out of his love for them. He talks about that in chapter one. In chapter one, he is encouraging them and he's even talking about his prayer for them. Then he explains how much he misses them. And there's, then there's the theme in chapter three where he longs to be with them. And then he even explains in 1, 2, and 3 how because he couldn't be with them, he's sending Timothy. And Timothy goes to minister to them to bring back a report. This is a love letter that is alive. And one of the most powerful things for me is that Paul deals with these themes that are important for us if we really want to be alive in our relationship with Christ. He keeps coming back to these themes, again, of love, encouraging them, of holiness, of this is how we're supposed to live. And then 
of that. Listen, here's the reality. You're on a journey and he is coming again. And so you find all three of these themes here in the book of Thessalonians. And so chapters one through three, a great deal of encouragement. But now in chapters four and five, he really now moves into, now there's some things that you need to do. Here are some things I need to remind you of. Yes, in chapters one through three, they were doing an incredible job of living out who Jesus had called them to be. But there's still some things he needed to remind them of. When I think about verses 1 and 2, where he talks about to them that, that you know what, you all really need to continue on. And really, that's the, that's the thing I want to talk about today, that, that I'm learning that, that the Christian life is really not a matter of finding that place of comfort but that the Christian life is a matter of continuing. When we think about continuing, those of you, you know I love music, and for whatever reason, I don't know if it's because of my, <laughs> I was thinking about the past, but when you think about continuing on, uh, and, and especially in the time that we're in right now, at this point, some of us are weary. At this point, some of us are tired. But my mind went to Gladys Knight and the Pips. Now, for some of you who don't know Gladys Knight and the Pips, you need to Google this song. I've got to use my imagination. Man, do not worry. Don't get afraid. I can't sing. But, but there was a line that, that, kept, that kept coming to my mind uh, where Gladys Knight says this. I've got to use my imagination. Here's what she says. She says, I've got to use my imagination. I can think of good reason to keep on keeping on. And then the pips in the back would go, keep on keeping on. And then she says, got to make the best. And then the pips would say, got to make the best, the best of a bad situation. I'm sorry, okay, let me stop. A bad situation. And ever since that day, I woke up and found that you were gone. Darkness all around me, blacking out the sun. Old friends call me, but I just don't feel like talking to anyone. Emptiness have found me and it just won't let me go. Go right on living, but why? I just don't know. But what did she say I got to do? I got to keep on keeping on. You know, one of the realities of what we're in right now is you don't have to use your imagination. But Gladys Knight is saying this, this place of losing a love has hurt us so bad. She can't stop. She's got to keep on keep it on. And for some of us, that's what we're feeling in this time that we're in. It feels impossible. It feels difficult. My mind also goes to the poem of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Sympathy. And most of us probably don't realize that when Maya Angelou wrote that incredible book of I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, where she captured the pain and struggle in her life, she was quoting Dunbar's poem, a part of his poem, Sympathy. Listen to this just for a moment. I know why the caged bird beats his wing till his blood is red on the cruel bars, for he must fly back to his perch and cling when he fain would be on the bow a swing and a pain still throbs in the old, old scars and they pulse again with a keener sting. I know why he beats his wing. I know why the cage bird sings. Ah oh, me, when his wing is bruised and his bosom sore, when he beats his bars and would be free. It is not a carol of joy or glee, but a prayer that he sends from his heart's deep core, but a plea that upward to heaven he flings. I know why the cage bird sings. Maya Angelou captured that her life had been like a caged bird and that again, part of that came from her story where because of an, a, seeing an abuser murdered that she stopped speaking for a long period of time and almost as if her life was in a cage, but she still learned how to sing. In this moment as believers, we may feel that man, what do we do in the midst of all of this? How do we live differently? Well, Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in, in three verses are going to give us some insight as to how we can't just try to find the place of comfort. And some of us, 
Look, you say, Pastor White, I just want to be comfortable. I just, James, I just want to find a place where I can just get at ease that no matter who we are, where we are, no matter how mature we might be, Paul is going to challenge us that we must continue. In many ways, we got to keep on keeping on. In verse 1, and I'm going to walk through this very slowly. I'm going to unpack these three verses very slowly because they're, they're about four things that I notice here in these verses that help us to continue, to help us to not just stay and find comfort, but to continue. Here's the first thing that I notice in verse 1. He says, finally then, brothers, and there's a comma, stop right there. Real important for us to understand, Paul is talking to family. Paul is talking to family. You see, even before we get to the part about sanctification, even before we get to the part about how we're to live with our life and our morality and how we're to conduct ourselves, one of the things that becomes real important that we don't want to mistake, make the mistake of is that God has a, has a reality for us because of who we are, not just what we should be doing. That first of all, our life comes from who we are, not just what we're supposed to be doing. And I apologize. If I've ever communicated in such a way that you're supposed to be doing something rather than first understanding who you are, because many of us associate Christianity, many of us associate what it means to be a follower of Christ, what it means to be saved, with this list of do's and don'ts of what you're supposed to be doing. When the Bible does not begin with what you're supposed to be doing, the Bible begins with who you are. And it is out of who you are that God in his word gives us what we're supposed to be doing. The other thing I want you to notice about the Apostle Paul, sometimes he gets a bad rap of being tough and difficult and narrow. But in most of Paul's letters, he spends a great deal of time encouraging, building up, telling them who they are. And then he spends the last part of his letter saying, now here's what you're supposed to do. He has that same pattern in, in Ephesians. He has that same pattern in, in Colossians of really building up. This is who you are. So first of all, Paul is writing to Christians. And when he says, finally then, brothers, that word brothers in the original language, it, it has a depthness to it. The Greek gives it this picturesque language that we miss sometimes. He's writing to people when it says brothers, it's people who come from the same womb. Finally then, people who come from the same womb. You said, man, Pastor White. And when I read it, I thought that's deep. But, but the reality is, is that if we know Jesus Christ, if we placed our trust in what Jesus has done on the cross for our sins, because the reality is, yes, all of us have been created in the image of God. But when we're redeemed by Jesus, when we've been purchased by Jesus, we experience what Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter three, you must be born again. And so the reality is, even as we journey in this time, we all are family. That is critical and important that we are in this together. And that's right. Even people you may think you don't like are still family. We're in this journey together. Now, let me tell you something. This is something First Lady has been talking about that has also challenged me. It's been our conversation. But it's somewhat sad, the judgmental attitude that some of us have had around leaders, bishops who have passed in the Church of God in Christ. And let me just say this. Yeah, there may be some doctrinal differences. Yes, there may be some things that were done out of passion and zeal that wasn't the healthiest decisions to make. But can I just tell you this? If, we, if they know Jesus... And, if, and I believe that we have brothers and sisters in the church of God in Christ. If they place their trust in Christ, we can't talk about these bishops like there's some other study or some group of people who will miss God. Yes, maybe so, but they're family. Paul is writing this to family. We should have a level of empathy 
when we're talking to family. So first of all, these instructions, when we talk about continuing on, we do that from a position of being family. And when he says brothers, he's talking about men and women. But then secondly, he's making a request of them. Notice what he says. He says here in the next part of the verse, he says, finally, brothers, finally, then, brothers. And when he says finally, then, it doesn't mean that this is the last thing he's going to say. I'm a lot like the Apostle Paul. Some of you have been with me uh, when, we, when we've been preaching at, at service. Y'all know I said this is my last point. <laughs> and it's another 20 minutes uh, before I get to my last point. No, this is his last section. So the next time, don't be hard on me uh, when you hear me say, this is my last point, last thing. Now, Paul is like a lot of us who are teachers and preachers. Now, this is the last section. Chapters four and five are going to be his last section. And he says, finally, then, notice what he says next. We ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus. Here's the second thing that he's doing. He's making a request, not only are they family, but he's making a request in light of their foundation. He says, we ask, we urge you, uh, urge in many translations is written, we beg you. And that word urge, and then he says, we urge and we ask, we ask, I'm sorry, ask in many translations, we beg you. And then urge means we exhort you. Now, one of the things that I found interesting, and again, you don't have to be a Greek scholar uh, to look up some of the words. You can go online. You've heard me talk about leak word project or strong concordance, but sometimes the original language helps you get a better picture of this. He says, first of all, we ask, we beg you. He said, what I'm saying to you is important. It's out of my love for you. But then he says, we urge you. That word urge comes from a Greek word, parakaleto, parakaleo, parakaleo. Now, parakaleo should sound familiar because when you look in the Gospels, we see that Jesus is going to send the Holy Spirit and he's the paraclete. It's the same idea of coming alongside of you. Here's what Paul is saying. Listen, Paul is saying, here's the request. He's saying, in light of your foundation in Jesus, we're begging you, but then we are urging you. Here's what he means when he says urge. Parakaleo, we're coming alongside of you in what we're getting ready to ask you to do. We're putting our arm around you. Here's what I love about God. When God asks us to do something, he's asking us to do something because we're family, but we're family because he's redeemed us, he's saved us. He's asking us to do something because he loves us. But then not only does he ask us to do something because he loves us, but then he parakaleo, he comes alongside of us. Saw this beautiful picture that made me think of my own kids, of Dr. Eric Mason. And he had this beautiful, I think it was a Snapchat, of him showing his little girl how to ride a bike. And it made me think about uh, my kids as well, is that all of us have had that moment when we helped our kids ride a bike. And you know, here's what you do when you help them ride a bike, is one of the things is when you take the training wheels off, then what you do is you, you come alongside of them, you, you guide them, and, and then you guide them, and then you say, okay, baby, keep pedaling, keep pedaling, and I'm going to let go. And then you let go, and then, man, some of us will still, if we see that bike wobbling, we'll start running and still keep beside them. But then we come alongside of them, and then we let go when we know that they can pedal. Paul says, finally, brethren, we beg you, but we come alongside of you. We're, we're asking you to do something where we're holding the bike with you, where we're coming alongside. And, and here's the beautiful part. That is what Jesus does. His Holy Spirit does in anything he asks us to do. He parakaleo. He comes alongside of us. Notice what he says in this language, though, to make you understand that this is an important request that he's getting ready to make. He's saying, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus Christ. What I'm getting ready to say to you, Paul is explaining, is, is that this is not simply something that's my opinion, 
But I'm asking you this in the authority of Jesus Christ. When, when he talks about authority, absolutely, we understand that, that, that he's saying this is coming from what Jesus wants, his authority. We get that. But F.F. Bruce in his commentary says it this way. It's, it's more of in the authority of Jesus Christ. What I'm going to ask you to do is in his presence. It's the same idea as in Matthew 8, 9, when the centurion uh, says to Jesus in Matthew 8, 9, where he talks about, I too am a man who's under authority and the soldiers under me. And, and I say to one, go and he goes, come and he comes, do this and he does that. And the centurion is saying, listen, all you got to do is say the word because I understand authority. Can I just say to us, God is asking us if we're going to continue to do something that he's asking us and he's coming alongside of us, but it's in the name of the Lord Jesus. That ought to change the way we live and respond to what God wants us to do, period. It's because it is in his name. It is in his authority. It is in his presence. Because the Christian life, it's not just a matter of are we going to be comfortable but how do we continue? Notice what else he says in this verse thirdly. He says, just as you receive here in verse one here, he says, finally, then brothers, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God. Here's the third thing that he's saying. He's saying here, listen, if you want to continue, you have to follow through. And he's affirming their follow through. He says, just as you received here, I, I love those words. He says, you receive from us what you need. You, you have the words of what it takes. Just as you receive from us, listen, we've given you what you need. You have the words from us from what you need. He says, but in this, he doesn't just could say that what you receive from us, what you need, he goes on and he says, but just as you receive from us instructions as to how you ought to walk and please God. What Paul is saying here to them is, is that you've received something from us, but he makes a connection. What you receive from us is you haven't received from us just instruction, but you receive from us how you ought to live and how you ought to to please God. See, one of the realities of God's word is we receive God's instruction, not simply for information. That's one of the challenges in the culture that we live in. It's one of my challenges sometimes. Sometimes I can think, okay, I got that. Or because we heard a message or we read something and it was, mm, this is good. But Paul connects something together. He says, you receive from us how you ought to walk. But your walk also is to please God. Now, here's something that's real important. Remember verse 3? Remember in verse 3, he talks about that this is for your sanctification. This is not for your salvation. This is not in order for you to be saved that you need to respond to the instruction that he says in order to be saved because salvation has already been secured in Jesus Christ. But when he says please God, it's because you are saved. Now, here's what he talks about here that was incredible, that was beautiful to me when I began to think about it. He says, you've received something from me, not just to accommodate your interests or desire, but you've received something, not just to please you and figure out how you can have a better life, but the purpose of what I'm saying to you is so you can please God. Sometimes I think we forget, and I say we, include myself, the journey in the Christian life isn't just to please us. That responding in obedience to what God has told us to do isn't just so that we can just have a healthier, better life. But the real reason is because so that we can please God. But notice he says, receive instruction in how you ought to walk. I don't want you to read that too quickly. And, and, and my mind goes, why in the world would Paul talk about how to walk? Isn't walking simple? You see this idea of walking all throughout the scripture. 
As a matter of fact, we're first introduced to the idea in Genesis chapter 3. It says what in Genesis chapter 3, when God comes on the scene, notice what it says, Genesis chapter 3, and they heard God walking in the garden. This idea of walking is all throughout scripture. Some even suggest that Paul might have been thinking about probably one of the first people in scripture that you really can see had this idea of walking down was Enoch. It said that in Genesis chapter 5, verse 23 through 24, it says, Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. When we see, here's what's so interesting. It says, Enoch walked with God for 300, this is so credible, his years were 365 years, he walks with God. Then it says he walked with God, and then God took him. This idea of walking is this idea of intimacy, this idea of being connected together, because that was the beauty of what Adam and Eve had, is that they were connected together with God. And notice here what happens is when they have sinned in Genesis 3, now all of a sudden they hear God walking rather than walking with them. They were naked and they hid themselves with God. The beauty of our relationship with God, hear me. Yes, I'm excited about salvation, but before Paul at the end of chapter four talks about Jesus coming to get us, he talks about this beautiful opportunity that we have to do something, to walk with God. Because notice the pattern, Enoch walks with God, then God took him. Paul follows that same pattern. He challenges the Thessalonians here in the beginning of the, of the chapter to walk with God. And then he'll talk about them being God coming back for us. That's the same pattern that we live with. What am I trying to say here? The instruction that we receive is so that we will walk with God. Now, I got to confess something. Uh, often, often I miss that relationships are formed in walking. My wife often cries out to me, and sometimes I do a good job, often I don't, because I like to run. But can you just walk with me? Can you just walk with me? And it's interesting that when you do walk with someone, there is this idea of literally being able to engage with them. Now, walking with my wife is not easy. It's not her fault but I tend to walk fast. I tend to get ahead of her. And you know what? In order to walk with her, I've got to slow down, be intentional, be in step with her. Here's what Paul is saying. Notice here in the verse here that, listen, the reason why you gave this instruction, Paul says, we told you this so that you would be able to walk with God. That word walk is a word that you see all throughout. There's, a, there's another word for it. It comes from the word, sounds familiar, peripateo. Peripateo means to follow. It means to keep in step. It's the kind of teaching that Jesus did. Think about it. When Jesus taught the disciples, the Bible is clear. He didn't have a place to lay his head. What did, what did they have to do? If they were going to follow him, they would have to walk with him. Jesus was a peripatetic teacher, just like Aristotle was. Many of his people would walk with him in order to learn. Here's what Paul is saying. The Christ of scripture who has died and risen again from the dead. Our relationship with Christ. Jesus is still peripateo. We are to walk with him in order to learn from him. Discipleship. This is not rocket science. It's simply that I got to keep in step with him. And for some of us, we want to run with God. Those of us sometimes, like myself, who are intense, and God is saying, no, I want you to walk with me. I want you, I'm giving you instructions. If you're going to continue, if you're going to keep going, then you're going to have to walk with me through some of the pains that you're going through right now. We're going to walk in this. You're going to walk with me in some of these moments that are very difficult moments. We're going to walk through this. You're going to walk with me in these moments of grief. We're going to walk through this. Yeah, I know you've discovered some areas of sin in your life. You've discovered some challenges in your life. Here's the thing. We're going to walk through this. 
Paul says, we gave you instructions so that you would walk with God. The first time I heard this idea, you all, was in, again, the historic black church. But the person who really made this famous for me was Fannie Lou Hamer. And Fannie Lou Hamer sung this spiritual that really came from the 1920s. But they're really not sure where it came from. They only know that it was a spiritual that that people of oppre the oppressed reality of slavery that was true in the black church. And some of you have heard this before, but I remember hearing Fannie Lou Hamer singing. Fannie Lou Hamer, if you don't know who she is, incredible voice of leadership out of Mississippi who, who had the phrase, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, who was an incredible movement leader for the right to vote for African-American people in the 1960s, even to the point to where it cost her something. But Fannie Lou Hamer, there's this one, and you can Google this online, where she stood up in a rally and she sung these words, walk with me, now Lord, walk with me, walk with me. And while I'm on this tedious journey, I want Jesus to walk with me. You know, I used to hear that, and one for a long time, I thought, okay, walk with me, Lord. Well, I get that, but while I'm on this tedious journey, and I would hear people say, what in the world, tedious? And tedious means this long, difficult, painful, trying journey. Here's the one thing I want, walk with me. That's what Paul is saying. We gave you instructions so that you would walk with him. Now, when I think about that, just on a very practical level, you know, when we walk, there's something we got to be aware of is we got to be aware of sometimes what can change our walk. And sometimes our trauma and our injuries, you know, it's interesting when you're just naturally walking. If you if you stump your toe, if you got an injury of a toe that you never think about, it'll change the way you walk. Uh, if you if you hurt your knee, it'll change the way you walk. Walking is simple, but it's complex. If you're wearing the wrong shoes, it'll change the way you walk. If, if you got corns and those shoes don't fit, it'll change the way you walk. What Paul is saying is, is we need to walk with him. But as we walk with him, for some of us, our injuries may cause us to slow down. And we have to acknowledge, hey, God, I want to walk with you, but I got some wounds and shame that's making it difficult. You can't walk in somebody else's shoes that don't fit. Uh, you have to walk in. Here's what's so beautiful, and just give me a moment with this. But I thought about this, and my mind went to what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6 when he's talking about the full armor of God. And notice what he says is feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Because if you're going to walk with him, you got to walk in the truth of the gospel. But notice what he says. He says here, just as you are doing, he encourages them. He says, you've been doing this. Why would he say the same thing? Because even if you have been doing something, we're human. We still need to be reminded. But now finally, at the end of verse 1, Look at what he tells them to do at the end of verse one. Let me read the whole verse to us one more time. Paul says it this way. Finally, then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that just as you receive from us instruction as to how you are to walk and please God, just as you actually do. But then notice what he says at the end of verse one. Why am I saying this? That you don't miss this, you all that you, again, would do so more and more. New American Standard, he says, that you may excel still more. Finally, here's why Paul is saying this, if we're going to continue. If we're going to continue, he's encouraging them to flourish. Paul is saying here, I'm saying this to you. Yeah, you've done it. You've done it well but that you can do more and more. In other words, don't stop. Keep going. I know for me, I'm looking for that time when, okay, when am I gonna be at the place when I can get comfortable and just sort of chill? Paul says, this, there's not a place for any of us. I don't care how mature we might be. I don't care. There's never gonna be a time where we get to stop, where we get to relax. You and I are designed to grow. 
We're designed to excel still more. I feel sad for some of us who think that I've already got enough. I don't need another Bible study. I don't need any more of this basic stuff. Or I'm kind of set in my spiritual life. And some of us, we've listened to the wrong ideas of spirit, what it means to be spiritual. Well, I'm kind of balanced. I like my job, like my marriage, like my church, kind of like everything. So I'm good, Pastor White. I don't need to go too much deeper. No, Paul says that I'm saying this so that you can excel still more. That challenges me. I've got to say, how do I still excel more? Don't stop. Keep going, keep on, keeping on. We're designed to grow. Most of us, the trouble happens when we get comfortable and don't live lives and make decisions that require courage. That's when the trouble happens. It's the same idea of what he's asking for is in Matthew 14, 20. Remember when he fed the 5,000 and the Bible says in verse 20 that they all ate and they were full and he took up the 12 baskets of full that were full of broken pieces that were left over. In other words, God always provides more than enough, but he provides more than enough so that the needs will be met and so that we can keep going. In Ephesians, now God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think. Why is he doing exceedingly and abundantly beyond all we can ask or think? Not so that we would stop, but so that we would keep going. Because even the exceedingly and abundantly that he does here doesn't match and compare the reality of what he's going to do one day when I meet him and he comes back for me. Paul says, I'm saying this to you because you can excel still more because when we stop it leads to decay and decay does not give us what we're designed to be and that is living people who are moving forward and who God has called us to be why does he want us to move for last two verses for you know that the what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus for this is the will of God why does he want them to move more? Why their family? For your sanctification. Sanctification, y'all, is the ultimate purpose in all of this. You know, remember Philippians chapter 2, uh, 12 through 13. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work within you. Why do you need to move more? Here's why. Life is not just about your salvation, but it's about your sanctification. Sanctification, we'll talk more about this next week, but it simply means this. It means that you were set apart for a particular purpose. Sanctification, it means you were set apart. You were holy, and that's why all of this is important because we're still on a journey of being who God has called us to B, this is not a time for comfort. This is a time for continuation. Sanctification is it's Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. We love that. But verse 29 says this, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Paul says, listen, the reason why finally, brothers, your family, the reason why you need to grow, the reason why, again, that you need to make sure your walk is right, that you're walking with him and not just trying to run with him or run from him. But the reason why all of this is so that you will move and grow more and more, that you will flourish. But why? Verse 2 and 3, for your sanctification. Last thing, when I thought about this, I, I thought about this because I have these, my, my favorite pens, my favorite pens here. And in my favorite pens, uh, one of the things is that I've got this pen, that's my favorite pen, and it's this pen right here. Now, now most people would say, Pastor White, this is just... <laughs> a regular pen and we'll see that's because and, and 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 i'm real particular i get bothered when somebody just takes my pen and they didn't ask me to borrow my pen because i'm always looking for my pen and it's not just it's just a favorite pen but this is my pen now some of you say well pass away it looks just like a pen well why not just get another pen uh if you don't have your 
own pen. It's just a pen. As long as the pen writes, isn't that what's important? Oh, but here's the reality. You don't know the story of this pen. <laughs> See, this pen was a pen that was just a pen. It's Marriott. It's from the hotel that you can get at any hotel. But this pen was a gift. This pen was a gift that was a costly gift. As a matter of fact, y'all don't know, but the pen costs well over $50. Now, y'all may still say I'm cheap, but listen, this is a $50, and it's a special kind of pen. And guess what? Yeah, the ink may run out sometimes quicker than a normal pen. And some of you may not like the way it writes because it's not a ballpoint pen, but it is my pen pen that has a story that you don't know the full story y'all don't know some of the stuff that this pen has written this is the pen i use in my journal this is the pen that i've written some things that i never want to forget here's the point i'm trying to make this is my pen that listen there's a story to my pen and it has value to me that you don't know about well, I got good news for you. God says you've been sanctified. You've been set apart. Other people may look at you and think that you can just use and be replaced by a regular Marriott pen. Isn't it, the main thing is that at least it writes? No, the main thing isn't that it writes because there's a story to this pen. This pen was purchased with a high price. You and I are sanctified. Why? We've been purchased with a high price. We've been purchased by the blood of Jesus. Jesus Christ. There's value to us. There's a story with us that we've been through, that we've gone through. We've been redeemed by something that's that really is more than what you and I could ever imagine. And here's the beautiful part. Listen, the pen doesn't belong to you. We belong to him. We're his precious one. We're the one that he paid a price for. We're the one that he laid his life down for. We're the one. And look, other people may look at us and say he can be replaced. God said, but you don't know the full story. You don't know what I redeemed him from. You don't know where he's been through. You don't know what he's gone through. And you don't know what I had to do to save him, to bring him right now so that he could write. And even if the cartridge has to be replaced regularly, I don't mind doing that because I'm the one that's able to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond all you can ask or think. Can I just tell you all, you and I, keep on keeping on. Don't get comfortable. We got to continue. Why are all these things true in these three verses? Because we've been set apart for him. My hope for us is that you understand we're family, family brethren. Understand, we've been designed to keep growing. The beautiful part, we can keep growing because he says, listen, we walk and we walk with him. And why is all of this important that we keep walking, that he wants us to excel? I don't care who you are. Listen to this, I don't care where you are in your relationship with Christ. Keep moving, keep excelling, keep doing more. Why? Because we've been sanctified, we've been purchased, we've been set apart by him. One of the things I want to do is what we normally do. I believe and I can see that God is speaking. I can see that in the chat. Together, can we say, what's the therefore of just these three verses? What's the therefore? What's the therefore? Thank you very much. We got to continue to walk as a family. What's the there for? Renewal requires fresh ink. Oh, can I just stop here for a second? Here's a beautiful part. The fresh ink, Ephesians 5, 18 says, do not be drunk with wine, where is an excess, but be filled with the spirit. And God gives us an opportunity to have fresh ink, to fill us, to control and empower us with his spirit. Absolutely. 
He walks with me and he tells me I am his own. He does. He wants to walk even more intimately with him. And one of the things we get a chance to do is to slow down and walk with him. Yes, God's will is our sanctification. You are valuable. Our sanctification is not a problem. It's a privilege. We've been set apart for him. Yes, therefore, keep growing. Keep growing. Let's walk with God, not run ahead of him. Uh, thank you, Latanya. We live to please God, knowing the world will not understand. They think we're just trying to be morally good or self-righteous. No, we're just trying to be who we've been created to be, set apart by him. Yes, Sister Sonia, our life is not our own. We are purchased. God will ask me to do things, yes, Rebecca, because he loves me. And then he'll come alongside of me. Know, yes, Orlando, that we are worthy. Benjamin, yes, we trust God's instructions. We must also trust he's beside us to live out those instructions. Listen, will you all keep writing this? I'm going to close us now. Father, thank you for this morning. God, thank you. I pray that we indeed would hear and hear the love of that Lord walk with me, walk with Jesus, walk with Jesus. While we're on this tedious journey, <laughs> Jesus continue, you will walking with us. Father, thank you that Lord, what we need to continue to keep going, to keep on, keeping on, you've already given us in Jesus and the power of your spirit and in your word. And I pray this week that for some of us, Lord, we would move out of our comfort and we would continue walking with you in a way like never before. God, would you surprise us with how you're going to continue to grow us? And it's in the name of Jesus that we're so thankful that you purchased us. You set us apart. Help us to live into that this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, don't forget Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, invite you Wednesday night uh, at, at 7. Love you all. I'm sorry, at 7.30. <laughs> Wednesday night at 7.30. Join us as we're going to go even deeper in some things. Hey, y'all continue the chat. Love you all. Thankful for what God is going to do. Now, may we keep on keeping on.